Hey guys, this is Patrick Hall with Halfstoppers.com. In today's video, I'm gonna be taking the Fujifilm GFX100 out on location and trying to capture a landscape photo, but I have to warn you, things are definitely not gonna go as planned. So this is another video from our sponsored video series where a bunch of manufacturers send us some really cool gear and they say, do whatever you want, take whatever type of photo you want. The only stipulation is, this needs to be a landscape photo. So all of the sponsored gear is gonna show up throughout this entire video, but let's go ahead and go out on location and let me show you the beach that I think is gonna be perfect for this photo shoot. So right now I'm on a beach here in Yabacoa and I actually live right on the other side of this hill. And for the last year, I've been hiking up there and when I get to the top and look down, I can tell this is one of the most beautiful beaches here on the East Coast. Now months ago when I first visited this beach, I noticed this cool old pier. It's got a lot of character and it just looks really ominous sitting out here all alone. And what might be the most interesting thing for me is that I haven't seen any other photographer shooting this location. If I go to Google Images, there's really not a whole lot more than just a few snapshots. So for me, I think this is really exciting because it's something that hasn't really been overshot and it's about 15 minutes right from where I live. So after seeing this beach from up high, I knew I had to come down and visit this. And when I got down here, the beaches are beautiful, but there's a lot of pretty beaches in Puerto Rico, and I think it's gonna be really hard to take an image that looks unique because all the beaches kind of look the same. One thing that is unique here, though, are these ruins of this pier. And I've been told that this pier was destroyed during Hurricane Maria, so I have no idea what it looked like just a few years ago. But right now, it's kind of this haunting image of what was here in the past. And I think that could be really cool to capture it, maybe do a long exposure, maybe do a sunrise, maybe even come out here later and get a star shot. I think there's a lot of possibilities. So instead of focusing on the beach in general, I think I'm gonna put all of my attention just on the pier itself. So right now today, I'm just scouting the location. I'm walking up and down the beach. I'm taking a bunch of different images, primarily of these ruins. I'm trying to find a cool composition that I like. I'm scouting with the Fujifilm X-T3 and I like this camera for scouting because it's much smaller. It's a lot easier to walk around with this. Right now I have the 16 to 55 millimeter zoom lens, which gives me a lot of options in terms of composition. But tomorrow I'm gonna come out here with the Fujifilm GFX100 medium format camera. I'm of course gonna bring a tripod. I'm gonna have some filters so that I can slow my shutter speed. I might even bring a light. So if I wanna do some light painting, I have that as an option. But right now, I just wanna focus on composition because when I come back tomorrow, I'm not gonna be able to see anything when it's dark. So I think my favorite composition that I've taken today is actually looking straight down the piers. And I have a few options here. I can shoot extremely wide and get really close to the pier and it's gonna look great. But I have to consider the tide. Right now, the tide's actually going out. I think I would actually have to put my camera on a tripod in the water. We'll see if that's an option tomorrow when I get out here when the sun rises. The other thing I could do is I could zoom in just a little bit, keep the camera on the sand, and not have to deal with the waves at all. That's obviously gonna be much safer, but I think I'm gonna lose something by not being really close to my subject. Having that wide angle view when you're really close to the foreground, it gives it a distinct look that you're not gonna be able to replicate simply by standing back and zooming in. So I don't think I'll know for certain until I get out here tomorrow, but I do have two really cool options. Now the first sponsor of this video is Sun Locator Pro, and they make a really cool app that's made specifically for Android that allows you to track both the sun and the moon so that you can plan your photo shoots perfectly. Now what's interesting about this app is there's a couple different modes that I can use to see exactly how the sun is going to affect my image. The first one is the map view. If I click on this, I can actually drop a pin right where I'm at, and then it gives me a little 24 hour bar here at the bottom, and if I scroll this back at the beginning of the day and hit play, it actually shows me where the sun will rise, where the shadows will fall, where the sun will be throughout the day, and then finally where the sun will set. So according to the app, the sun is actually gonna rise just outside of my frame to the far left of this mountain. So it will be completely blocked if I set up here shooting out towards the water. And it's also telling me that the sun will set right behind this mountain here, which it's doing right now at this very moment. Another feature of this app that's really interesting is the 3D terrain simulation. Now if I click on this, it's pulling data that creates a topography map. So as you can see, it's showing the shadows that are being cast by the mountains both at sunrise all the way through high noon, and now it's showing me the shadows being cast here at sunset. If I compare what the app's doing to real time, it actually looks pretty accurate. I don't think the sun is going to affect my shot as much in the morning as it might in the afternoon, but 
With this, I can plan accordingly, and it also allows me to go through different seasons. So maybe the sun's not rising and setting exactly where I want right now. I could figure out the perfect time of year to come back to this location and get the perfect light on my scene. And then the final setting is camera view, and this is really cool. If I click on this, it opens my phone's camera, and it overlays all of that information using the camera itself. And so I can scroll through the sky and see the exact arch where the sun should rise, where it sets. It's right now exactly where it says. And it gives me a much better idea of where the sun's gonna be. And as you can see in this app, it's actually telling me that it's gonna rise right behind the mountain, which is where the other simulation showed it was gonna rise earlier. This app's also great for photographers because it shows me when the blue hour is, when the golden hour is. It tells me in the morning for tomorrow, I need to be up at 6.08 and then from 6.30 on, the sun will be rising. So that's about 20 minutes of blue hour before the sun rises. And then tonight it's telling me the sun is gonna give me a nice golden hour shot from 5.14 to 5.45, which is right now. And the sun will officially set at 5.45. So a lot of photographers might want the sun in their shot. I'm actually trying to avoid that. I want the sun to rise just outside of my frame. And this app guarantees that that's gonna be the case tomorrow. So now that I know exactly where the sun's gonna be rising, I know I need to be out here at six in the morning and I have my composition set, I'm gonna go home, pack everything up, set that alarm, and you know me, I'm gonna love getting up early in the morning. Now the bag I'm gonna be using for this photo shoot is the Low Pro BP550 Trekker bag. This thing's incredible because it allows you to connect two different tripods, one here on the side and one on the front, which I'm gonna be doing here in a minute. Now this backpack is gonna be a little bit of overkill for what I need to do tomorrow because I'm really not hiking very far, but this bag is designed so that if you wanna carry a lot of gear and you're having to hike for miles, it's gonna distribute the weight much more evenly across your body, which if you've ever hiked, you know how important that is. Now this bag is super secure. It has this nice little pouch that keeps everything locked down. You can actually put stuff in here. But what I like about this configuration is you can take this off, undo it on the sides here, and this will actually just remove. So if you don't actually need this little pouch that holds maybe like your lunch or something outside the bag, you can just take that off. Let me go ahead and set this down sideways, open this up. And you can see right here, this is the area where we're gonna put our tripod. It's got this nice little foot here. It's where you can put a tripod here, lock it down. And then you can put all your straps across it. So I'm gonna be using that. And then because I'm gonna be filming, I'm also probably going to attach a tripod here on the side. So really convenient if you do blogging and you need to have two tripods with you, this is definitely a nice bag for that. So let's go ahead and open this thing up. And as you can see here, I have the X-T3 with my scouting lens, the 16 to 55. I'll keep that right in there. Now the camera I'm gonna be shooting with is the Fujifilm GFX100. Now this camera is amazing because one, it's medium format. It also has 102 megapixels, so we're gonna have a ton of resolution, and you can shoot 14 and 16-bit files. What this means is you're gonna have a ton of dynamic range to where you can pull out as much detail and really manipulate the files in post-production, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, for this shoot, I'm probably gonna be shooting on the 32 to 64 millimeter lens, but I've also packed a much wider lens this is their 23 millimeter F4 lens. This could be really good if I can get close to the piles. I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to do that. So I'm gonna be taking both of these lenses. Because we're gonna be working in low light, I'm also going to take this pocket light. This is the Falcon Eyes F7 RGB light, which allows me to change it into a bunch of different colors. I'm also gonna take an umbrella bracket. I can mount this to the light put it on a light stand, which I have over here, and that's going to allow me to illuminate my scene, which is really most useful because I'm gonna be filming myself out on location. Now, I also have some Polar Pro neutral density filters, which are going to allow me to do longer exposures if I wanna blur the sky or the water. I also have a couple step down rings because my filter is an 82 millimeter filter, but one of my lenses is a 77 millimeter lens. It's easier just to buy these step down rings and then you can use one filter on every single one of your lenses. So that's really all that I'm gonna be packing. We still have a lot of room in this backpack, and of course it has a spot here so you can slide a laptop, but I think for this shoot, I'm gonna to try to go as light as possible. Let's get some sleep because the next time you guys see me, it's gonna be bright and early, and hopefully we'll be able to get a really cool sunrise location with all these piles nicely backlit. My sunshine has come.
and I'm walking out. There ain't no more rain in the sky. Today has brought a ray of light into my night. All right, so the sun's rising right now. Everything's in place. I have the camera just taking some bracketed shots. And the craziest thing happened to me out here. I don't know if you can see this, but there are these red lights. And this whole beach is lit with red lights. Of course, I'm using a red light now so that I can uh, see without really messing up my vision. But as soon as I got out here, this patrol boat pulled right up and all these spotlights came out on me. I wish I was filming. And I turned on my light and I started lighting up my camera so they would be able to see that I'm just a photographer. But it feels like maybe this area is an area with like high drug trafficking or something because this beach is so secluded. Pretty weird experience. All right, so I'm out here all by myself. I couldn't get Lee to come up early enough to help out. He hates the mornings more than I do. I've already been harassed by border patrol and Although the sun's just starting to come up and there's a little bit of blueness in the sky, I can tell there's absolutely no clouds, which is really what I want with a good sunrise. If I look to my left, it feels like there's more clouds over there, but the clouds right behind these piles are non-existent. So I'm gonna continue to shoot through this. It's about 5.30, so the sun hasn't risen yet, but let me talk about some of the camera settings that I'm using to guarantee that I get the best possible picture. The first thing that I've done is I've gone into the menu and I've turned off the in-body stabilization. In-body stabilization is great if you're hand-holding your camera or if you're shooting video, but since we're on a tripod, it can actually be detrimental to the image quality. So I've gone ahead and turned that off. The next thing that I've done is I've actually turned the camera down into manual mode. And because I have my back AF on button set to do the focusing, I can focus with that button, but when I hit the shutter, it's not gonna refocus. The last thing that I want is my focus constantly changing, even if it's just a little bit. I wanna get my focus perfect, I wanna lock it down, and then I never wanna change that. Now normally it would be impossible for me to focus on these piles before the sun rises, and it'd be impossible for you to see me, but I actually brought out this LED panel. I always pack one of these LED panels in my bag because if I need to light something out on location, sometimes the light on my phone is just not powerful enough. These LED lights can really be useful out in dark situations like this. So right now I'm currently using the 32 to 64 millimeter lens because I'm waiting for the sun to rise, but I'm also waiting for the tide to go out. As you can see, the water is hitting my tripod a little bit. Ideally, I would be just a few feet closer, but I don't want to risk getting this camera completely drenched. And because I'm the only person out here, I'm probably going to be switching through lenses as the sun rises, but being a one man show here, I'm not able to quite film everything that I would like to. As the sun rises, I can see some clouds on the horizon, but I'm a little bummed out because ideally I would have the whole sky full of clouds. That would give me the most dramatic image. I think once the sun rises, it's just gonna be a boring blue or orange sky. I always hate when this happens because it's so early in the morning, but hopefully some clouds come in and I actually get the shot that I want. So as the sun's starting to rise, you probably can't see it on the camera because it's still really dark this way. I can tell there's just a few clouds, and as you can see from these images, the clouds are way on the horizon, but they're not filling the entire sky. So I'm already getting to that point where I feel like this is a failure because this is not gonna be dramatic enough. The other problem with this photo is that the piles are completely backlit to the point you can't really tell what they are. It almost looks like trash or something. I think it would look a lot better at sunset I wouldn't get the sky to be as dramatic in the background, but at least I would have some light hitting the piles and you could tell what they're made out of. Now, when I first got out here, the sky was full of these amazing stars, which makes me think maybe this shot could work at night as a star shot, but I've gotten out here too late to where there's already enough blue light in my long exposures that it's not gonna work for a starlit shot. Unfortunately, when you can see a lot of stars, that also means there's no clouds in the sky, and this shot, really would probably look the most dramatic with long streaking clouds as the sun rises. So I'm gonna continue to shoot through this as the sun rises, but I think I'm gonna get an image that's pretty blue, pretty clear. I can blur out the water, but I have no clouds to blur out. So as you can see from this photo, this is probably the best shot that I'm gonna get. The sun's already starting to get pretty bright out here. So maybe I should come back out here late at night before the moon rises and get a star shot maybe that's going to be the best image of this structure that I'm going to get. All right, so I'm 
I'm back out here, attempt number two. It's about nine o'clock. My app has told me that the moon is gonna rise at about 11, but it's been late enough in the day that we should be past the blue hour and the night sky is gonna be really dark. So I have a little window before that full moon comes out and completely ruins my sky. Now, I do have some lights on over here. There's this big, bright floodlight that's going down the beach. I'm hoping that's not gonna be a problem. And then I also have some red lights here that I showed you guys earlier in the morning. I don't think they're really gonna be a problem because they're so faint, but who knows? We're gonna be shooting for about 20 to 30 seconds. If I shoot any longer than 20 or 30 seconds, the stars are gonna start to burn across my frame and give that streaking effect. For this shot, I really want the stars to be static. So I don't want to do a super long exposure. For camera settings, I've changed to F4. So I'm shooting as wide open as this lens goes. I'm gonna bump my ISO up to about 1250. And I'm going to guess that I need to be around 15 seconds. Let's go ahead and do a test shot. And as you can see from that image, it's like the sky is not quite dark enough. I'm wondering if it's that light over there. I'm a little worried. And I don't know why I didn't notice this earlier in the morning, but I'm worried that that floodlight behind me is actually polluting the sky enough to where I'm not gonna get the most dramatic stars. Let me go ahead and go all the way up to 20 seconds and let me see if the stars get any brighter. We'll let that capture. And, oh boy. And now I'm actually getting the piles here. They're going really red. So that red light in the parking lot feels very faint to me. I'm actually shocked it's doing anything, but in a 30 second exposure, it's definitely bleeding onto the piles. I guess I could potentially try to fix that in post. Maybe I could like lasso tool everything and select just the piles and bring down the saturation. But I'm still getting more light in the sky from this light behind me. So I don't think that's working either. I almost wish I just had Lee here and he could just go put a piece of cardboard right up against that light and block it out. So as you can see, this image is not gonna work. This is a total failure. I think I'm gonna pack it up. At least I didn't waste too much time. But the only other option I have is to come back tomorrow at sunset. Maybe we'll get a good photo then. But I think this is a good lesson because many people see our videos, especially the ones we've done with Elia Licardi, and everything seems to magically just work out. But that's not the real life of a landscape photographer. In many cases, you're out here trying to get a cool shot and it doesn't work. Luckily, third time's the charm, right? So I'm gonna pack up, and the next time I see you, I'm gonna be back on this beach, and dang it, we're gonna get a photo. We're going to get a photo. So sunrise failed, star shots failed, but I am not one to give up. Here we are on my third attempt, and this time I'm going for a more traditional sunset photo. We have the sun setting exactly where the app said. We have these nice piles. I've composed the image exactly like I had for the star shot. And now what I think I'm gonna do is take a few images with a relatively short shutter, maybe like one to four seconds long, and with the neutral density filter and a really long exposure, I think I can get the water to look really dreamy and hopefully get some of these clouds to blur as well. Now I do have some clouds moving into my frame. They're not as many as I would like, but what's super frustrating, and every landscape photographer can relate to this, is the clouds right outside of my frame are absolutely breathtaking. It's just something you have to live with. Of course, we could drop a fake sky in, but I'm gonna try to do this all in camera with one single frame. So right now I'm shooting at f16. That's the aperture right in the middle range of this lens. That's gonna give me the cleanest and sharpest image. I'm shooting at two seconds right now. Let me go ahead and take a picture. And that looks pretty good. And as you've seen on our channel, in many cases when you're shooting with a slow shutter like two seconds, it's probably a good idea just to take a bunch of images to really time the waves so that you can find that perfect frame. 
Sometimes it's great to have the waves crashing towards the camera. Other times you might actually prefer the waves crashing a little further out. And if you have turbulent waters, you can get some really cool effects when you start to get into the one to three second time frames. So some of these images look pretty cool, but I'm gonna go in my bag, I'm gonna get a 10 stop neutral density filter. And based on my calculations, I'm gonna be able to get maybe an eight minute exposure. I'm not gonna be able to get a whole lot of them, but by using a ridiculously long eight minute exposure, I know my water is gonna become really dreamy and the clouds are gonna have that nice wispy surreal look to them. So this is a 10 stop neutral density filter. And as you can see, you can't see through this at all. Now we always buy our filters in the 82 millimeters so that they fit on every single one of our lenses. This zoom lens, unlike the prime lens, is not 82 millimeters, it's actually 77. So I have an adapter on here that just steps this down so that it fits this lens. And if I just come down here and screw this on and hopefully don't drop it into the ocean. There we go. I can use these larger filters on a lens that has a smaller threading. Now what I really like about the GFX100 is unlike other cameras that might stop at just 30 seconds, you can keep scrolling this further and further, two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes is the calculation that I've done for a 10 stop filter. I really love that they have these longer time frames built in. I think all camera manufacturers should do this. But now that I've pre-focused, I've put the filter on and I've calculated that my exposure is gonna be around eight minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and hit the shutter. And it also counts down right on the back of the screen, which is really convenient. I don't have to sit here with my phone and wait for a timer to go off. It's just gonna stop exposing as soon as this timer ends. All right, so I just completed my second eight minute exposure. I've gotten two of these shots now and they look drastically different because at this time of day, the sun is setting really quickly and eight minutes actually changes the entire scene pretty quickly. So I don't think I have enough time to do another eight minute exposure. It's actually probably gonna be a 16 minute exposure right now, but I have another kind of unorthodox idea. The sky still looks really great right now, but I'm losing a lot of detail on the piles themselves. But I brought an umbrella and an LED light, and since my exposure is so long, I have a crazy idea of setting up my umbrella right here on the side of the beach and maybe I can introduce a little bit of light here at the end of the day so that there's some detail in the piles while I still have the nice light in the sky. Let me go ahead and get that set up and maybe we can add a little bit of natural light painting to this image to make it really pop. Now as you saw when I was packing my backpack, I always like to put a few LEDs in there because many times we're filming videos like this but sometimes I need a work light and other times there's some really unique ways to use a light panel and light paint your scene. So what I have here is a simple umbrella bracket. And then I'm just gonna mount this pocket light that I have to the top of this. When setting up these lights, you always want to use a sandbag. So I usually put this right down here so that it weighs the whole thing down so it doesn't tip over. So as you can see, this light is tiny and if I turn this on, it's gonna be extremely bright but it's also gonna cast really hard shadows. And I want much softer light. I don't want this to look like some super dramatic light painting. I want it to look a lot more natural, even though it's going to be an LED light. So I'm gonna use one of the least expensive light modifiers that we own. And this is just an umbrella softbox. This is just like a normal umbrella. It just opens just like that, but it's got this nice diffusion panel, which is gonna help soften the light. And so I'm just gonna place this here in my umbrella bracket. I'm gonna set this to 5,000 Kelvin, so it's a nice white light. Let's just tuck it inside this thing. Now, if I set this light up really close to these piles, it's gonna light the ones that are closest to it a lot harder than it's going to light the ones further away, and it's gonna be a much more dramatic light source. I want this to look as natural as possible, so instead of getting this light really close to my scene, I'm gonna raise this up really high, and what I love about this light stand is this thing it gets tall. This is my favorite light stand we own. I mean, look how high I can get that. And right now, if you were to look at the scene, it's not really affecting it a whole lot, but you could imagine if I do a 60 second or a two minute exposure, that little bit of light, especially as the ambient light drops, is going to make a pretty big effect. And if I can time this perfectly, right about now, I think I can balance this little bit of artificial light with some of the light that's still left in the sky. So I don't need my 10 stop neutral density filter anymore. Those exposures would just simply be way too long now. But with that off, I think I can get an exposure that's maybe two minutes. 
So right now this effect is still really subtle because the ambient light is still relatively bright. It's pretty crazy out here seeing this light on because it feels dark, but when I do a long exposure, the ambient light over a minute is still much brighter than the ambient light coming out of this light. But I think in the next like five to eight minutes, we're gonna get that perfect balance where the artificial light is bright enough to now do something in our scene and the ambient light's a little darker to where it's not overpowering the scene. So we're getting towards the end of the day here. I've gotten some great pictures. I really like the long exposures I got earlier in the day, but I'm just gonna stay out here a few more minutes and just get a few more long exposures with this LED light. So using an umbrella with an LED light off to the side, you know, 12 feet up in the air is not a technique most landscape photographers do, but I think it's pretty interesting. And if I'm trying to get this image perfect in camera without a whole lot of post-production, this is definitely one way to do it. Now I've been out here three different times with three completely different lighting situations, but let's go back to a computer that's look at these images high res and see which one of these images is our favorite. All right guys, welcome to the post-production studio. And as you can see, nothing really went as planned for this video, but I still think it was pretty interesting because I don't recall ever going back to the same location for three different times in three completely different lighting scenarios. So I'm curious to see what you guys think about these images and if one of these stands out as your favorite. Let me dive right into this. Again, I was trying to get everything pretty much right in camera, so I don't think I'm gonna be doing a whole lot of post-production, but I do wanna show you some of the tweaks that I did to the raw files um, to kind of get a finished, final, polished image. So here is probably the best shot from the morning session, and as you can see, there's really no clouds in the sky, and it was such a bummer because I was right there at the right time, early in the morning, and the weather did not cooperate with me. So let me just show you what this file looked like at a camera. It looks something like this, and imagine being behind the camera at the beach in pitch darkness, and this is what you see on the back of your screen. It wasn't the most reassuring moment, but uh, just by tweaking you know, some of the exposure, the highlights, you can see here I added some dehaze. And for an image like this, there's really a lot of directions that you can go in terms of color. We could try to make this really pink and warm like it is here, or I could come down and try to cool it down and make it look very different. I played around a lot with the tint and the temperature trying to get this to really work out. In the end, I went with something like this. I think it's pretty boring to be honest with you. I just don't think there's enough light in the sky to make the pillars look interesting and then there's just no clouds. But as you can see, the tide was really low. I was able to get incredibly close uh, to the front of this pier, whereas some of the other attempts weren't so successful. Now, because I've renamed some of these files, they're showing up out of order. Let me show you what the star shot looked like. This was my second attempt. This is straight out of camera. And as you can see, we have a lot of red hitting these piles. So let me show you what I would try to do to salvage this picture and why ultimately this is not gonna work. First thing I wanna do is bump up my exposure quite a bit. And as I bump up this exposure, you can see the reds are just getting even brighter and more prevalent in the image. And then we also have this horrible red light casting into the murky water here. Not really great. One thing that was kind of working for me is there was no clouds in the sky. I mean, I have a couple clouds here. I think if I would have stayed out longer, I probably could have had a completely clear night. But the biggest problem here is this color cast. So I can do everything I want with these sliders and try to bring out some of the highlights and the shadows and make this look as good as possible. For a star shot like this, I actually might bring the shadows down and bump the highlights, which is kind of opposite of what you typically would do. You're typically trying to bring detail out of the shadows and retain some of the highlights. But something like this looks pretty decent. I can come down here to the dehaze, and maybe the dehaze actually makes it look pretty good. But let's tackle the elephant in the room. Let's talk about these red tones. Now, I thought I could just come down here to my HSL sliders and I could take maybe my red saturation and just drop it. And then we still have some orange, maybe I could just drop that. But it quickly starts to look like a selective color image, which looks super cheesy. So maybe I need to play around with the hue and just change these colors to something else. Now the orange, there's really just nothing I can do with this. Let's try the reds, let's bring the reds back up. I 
as you can see, there's just really not a whole lot that I can do to make this look good. This might be the best that I can do to try to remedy this problem, but as you can see, it just looks cheesy and cheap. It just looks like I took a night sky and made it all blue and then desaturated everything else. So, Starshot did not work. One thing I have been thinking about since we have a lot of power outages here in Puerto Rico, and as you know, we just had these major earthquakes that affected a lot of the power grid, is to try to time this shot, if I think this is worth pursuing, to another power outage. And maybe if the power went out and every, everybody's out of power, I bet those red lights would also be out and that might be the perfect time to run out there late at night and try to take a picture. Who knows if I'll ever get around to doing that. Let's head to the final day where I go to shoot the sunset. And before I lock down my composition, I did play with a few other compositions that I think are pretty nice. This just looks like a pretty standard landscape. Let me show you what the initial image looked like. And as you can see, there was really no detail in the blacks but just by pulling out some of the, uh, the detail in the shadows, I was able to bring back a lot of resolution and detail. So I went from this to this. And one other little trick I wanna show you guys that I don't think everybody knows about, but I do this all the time with my landscapes, and that is the calibration slider. If I come down here in Lightroom and come down to the blue primary slider. I don't know why this works. I don't know the theory behind it, but if you bump up the saturation just on the blue channel, in many cases, it can make your landscape photos look really, really punchy. So I'm going to take this all the way up to 100 and see what it does. And if I just toggle this on and off, you can see what it's doing. It's, it's very subtle in this shot. Sometimes it's a lot more predominant but it's just really boosting all of the colors in a way that looks natural. It's almost like a vibrancy slider, but just for very specific tones. And it's not always the blue tones. You'd think it would be blue, but you can see it's bringing a lot of color back into the, the clouds here without making it look too crazy. So I just wanted to show you guys that one. And then finally, here is one last other composition that I thought could be interesting. I really like this because it places the city or the little town behind the pillars. I don't know if it's graphically as strong as the other compositions, but I did really like this and the sunset this particular night was amazing and I loved all the colors that were being cast. But let's look at some of my favorite shots from the third day that I think are actually the best shots of the entire session. So here's an image where it was shot at 140 seconds, F11, and you can see I get that really nice blur in the water, but the length of the shutter is not so long that the clouds go blurry. They do start to get a little wispy up here, but for the most part, you can see a lot of definition. Here's the next frame with a lot shorter of a shutter. This had an eight second exposure. And because the sun was setting a little bit differently and some clouds moved in, you can see, I think the clouds are a little bit nicer in this frame. This shot photographically, there's really no tricks here. Yes, it's an eight second exposure, but it doesn't really read like that. It almost just looks like a really simple, well-framed image. Um, if I were to, edit this anymore, maybe I would remove the mountain here. I think that's just a little distracting, but there's really nothing you can do with the camera placed right here to get rid of that. Maybe I also clean up just some, you know, some of this debris out here. It's like a, a little coral reef or something. Let's continue on. So this is the final shot that I was able to do an extremely long exposure on. This was shot at 480 seconds, which is eight minutes. And you got to imagine when the sun is setting, an eight minute exposure, every additional minute that you add is actually affecting the exposure less and less because the sun is going down more and more. So you get to a point where the next image I would take to get the same exposure would potentially have to be like a 20 minute exposure. And then at that point, you're just completely out of light. So when you're doing really long exposures towards the end of the day or early in the morning, there's really a perfect window to be able to pull off the perfect exposure and in many cases if you do something as long as this eight minutes you're only going to get a handful of them before it just isn't possible anymore you can see what it did to the water here it made it super dreamy and it gives you kind of this misty look which i really like one interesting thing is i had a bird that landed and he must have sat there for six minutes and did not move i was actually filming b-roll trying to get him to fly off he never flew off until the very end of the exposure. And you can kind of see he's just sitting there like a ghost. I'd probably Photoshop him out. Kind of an interesting image. I like the water effect, but I don't know overall if there's enough going on in this image for me to warrant keeping this one. And so in the next shot, you can see the sun's really setting. I went from eight minutes to now 50 seconds. 
And I love this image. I think it looks really good. The piles are just starting to get a little dark. If I look up here in this thumbnail, I always like to look at the thumbnail and see if that really grabs me because in many cases, that's the size of a picture somebody might see if they're browsing. And I just don't think it really has enough punch. So what did I do? I brought out the LED light. And as you can see, we went from very little light on the piles to a significant amount of light on the piles. Now one downside from this lighting technique is I am starting to light my foreground and the wash kind of gets this ugly yellow green color. So I thought, well, I like the foreground of this image. This looks really nice and backlit and you see the clouds reflecting into the water and everything. But I like the light on the piles here better. So what did I do? I threw these both into Photoshop, combined the best elements of each, and I wound up with this. This is probably my favorite image where you got the piles nice and lit. They're not lit so much that it looks like strobe. I don't even think you would really register this as flash or strobe or artificial light in any way. But we also have retained all the cool detail um, here in the foreground. As the light lowered even more, you can see from this image, my constant light is really taking an effect now and you can really tell that it's pulling out the details. It's starting to look a little more artificial. I really like this image too. I feel like it, it's just believable enough, but it adds enough of a majestic, strange quality to it that I think this image might stop a viewer and say, hey, let me poke around and look at this image a little bit more than some of the others. You can also see we're starting to get some stars up here. And because this is a 50 second exposure, we're starting to get those star trails. When I see this image, I get really excited and think there's so much potential for a nighttime star shot. But again, once the sun completely sets, you're gonna get those red lights spilling into the frame. I haven't figured out how to tackle that quite yet. But I really love this. I think the clouds and the wispiness of this look really cool. This is another really nice frame. And then finally, it just got way too dark to do any sort of long exposure. So I dropped my shutter down to two seconds and I opened up to F4. So I'm gonna have a lot less depth of field. But I also zoomed out a little bit and I just tried to experiment a little and find some frames that I liked. I don't know if I really like any of these frames, but there is something neat about the surf breaking right here in the bottom of the frame. If I open up the original image, you can see how much wider I was. And then with some tweaks in Lightroom, I was able to bring it here. I think this is a better crop. This one too, kind of interesting. Maybe there's something here, but this starts to feel a little too stroby. You can just see that constant LED light really lighting up the foreground. I don't know if this does anything for me. I wanted to go into a more subtle, fine art direction. I think if I sort these by my absolute favorite, I think it's between this image, this image, and this image. And as you can see, my camera didn't change at all between these exposures, so maybe there's some blending that I could do as well to try to make this a little more interesting. Now one tool that I think is really useful that a lot of people might not know about is the transform tool. And because I was shooting fairly wide, I'm shooting at 35 millimeters here, and I framed the scene so that I had a little bit more sky, anticipating a really nice sunset, I started to get the piles to kind of converge towards the middle. And so if you wanted to make this not so distorted, even though the horizon's nice and the lens isn't really distorting, it's just the angle of being low and pointing up, the transform section here will allow me to get these really nice and straight. So if I come down to vertical here, and I just pull this down just a little bit, I think that might be all that I need to do. I can hit constraint crop, and if I go between the two, you can see it just kind of straightens up my image. Really simple tool to use here in Lightroom. And just for kicks, let's see what that calibration blue slider does if I just move that up. See, 100%, it's just way too much. If I take it all the way down, it almost starts to get a matte finish. But maybe, I don't know, maybe plus 10, somewhere in there is kind of interesting. And since this was shot at 100 megapixels, I know you guys want to see all of the nice detail. Look at that. You can see everything, all the old barnacles and stuff and the wood and rust. I don't even know what this is made out of. I don't think this is wood. It's like concrete, but it's breaking and chipping away in a way that looks really organic. You got some sharp little pieces of debris in there. It's just really interesting. And so the last thing I just want to leave you with that I have just realized shooting with the GFX 100 and a larger sensor camera that's kind of interesting is that I'm able to still get a fairly shallow depth of field even at f16. If I zoom in here, you can see that 
All the trees back here are a little blurry and soft in a nice aesthetic way. And if I come all the way over here to these buoy markers, they also aren't crystal clear. And I like that. I think it gives some three dimensionality to your photos. But on a smaller sensor, if I was to shoot at F8 or F16, which is typically the sharpest part of your lens, I'd probably reach that hyperfocal point where everything in the entire photo is nice and sharp. And if I wanted to get this look, I would have to open up more, but by opening up more, you're not getting the sharpest quality out of your lens. With larger sensor cameras, you're able to stop your lens down four stops or so, so that you can get the absolute best quality out of your lens. But because the sensor is larger, you are able to still get a little bit of that depth of field play, which I think can look really nice. Now I know in landscape photography, a lot of people want the most depth of field from front to back, but I think for an image like this, if I was to print this really large and walk right up to it, I think I would appreciate that, especially right here where you can see all this detail in this pile and then right next to it, you have something that reads really well, but it still has a photographic quality that is very pleasing to many people. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know this was a little bit different since I had so many failures. I did not plan necessarily to go out and take three completely different photos. But if you enjoy content like this, make sure you head over to fstoppers.com for free daily articles. If you enjoy videos like this, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel below and hit the little bell so that you're notified when we have new videos. We release videos like this every single week. And if you wanna learn from some of the best photographers in the world who get into this stuff way deeper than I ever could, head over to fstoppers.com store where you can check out our full length tutorials.